Today, I want to talk about what I think is the biggest bargain in hi-fi right now, and that is the WIM amp. It isn't perfect, but I think it's absolutely superb, especially for its 299 US dollar asking price. This episode is brought to you by Made by Music, the new podcast from Cambridge Audio. Welcome back, everybody. Yes, if you've unboxed a MacBook or a MacBook Pro, you've already unboxed the WIM amp because the box's dimensions, its graphic design, and its slow release lid are all really similar to Apple's. And get your ruler out because, as we'll see, the, the top of the WIM amp measures within a whisker of the Mac Mini. So I think the WIM amp measures 19 by 19 on the top plate and the Mac Mini 19.7 by 19.7. And also very Apple-esque are the WIM amps color options. We get a choice of space gray or silver. And then there's the WIM logo that's cut into the top plate, which reads identically from the front and from the back. And for me, recalls the sort of upside down thinking behind the Sonos name. So Link Play, that's the manufacturer behind the WIM brand, they clearly know a winning formula or two when they see it. Not that Link Play hasn't really developed a winning formula of its own. I should really say it, not they. For the last year and a half, Wim has prodded cash conscious audio files with its Mini, its Pro and its Pro Plus network streamers. And those streamers have put a combination of Google Chromecast, Apple AirPlay 2, Spotify Connect, Tidal Connect and Rune Readiness into many a lounge room for not very much money at all. So for example, the WIM Pro Plus offers greater streaming flexibility than the 400 and, what is it, the Sonos port, 449 US dollars or 399 US dollars? And so basically the Pro Plus does everything that the port does and more for 200 fewer dollars. And loaded with the same streaming power as the Pro Plus, the new WIM amp makes an even better first impression. Because the plastic casework on the WIM Pro Plus has been replaced by aluminium on all sides apart from the bottom on the WIM amp. And there's also a physical volume wheel that we can push for play pause if we don't feel like reaching for the supplied remote control or WIM's most excellent home smartphone app. And because that remote control pairs with the WIM amp over Bluetooth LE, the amplifier itself can be stashed away out of sight if we really want to. Not that the amp is really all that physically intrusive or displeasing to the eye. I mean, for me at least, it's the epitome of understated hi-fi minimalism. But take note, at the time of this video's recording, Rune isn't yet ready for the amp. I guess it'll come in due course. So in my testing, I sent Rune streams to its Chromecast input, but I could have just easily used its AirPlay 2 input. Now, the Wim Home app, which I mentioned previously, also integrates Cobus and Amazon Music HD, but I don't use either of those two. And on the back panel of the Wim amp, we get inputs for analog, Toslink, and my favorite of the moment, HDMI ARC. Now, I no longer have a Sonos amp to hand here for a side-by-side -side comparison with the WIM amp. But you could drive a truck through the price differential. I think it's about 400 bucks in price difference between the WIM amp and the Sonos amp. And the WIM advantage doesn't end there as far as I can tell, because compared to the Sonos, it's more extensively specced on streaming systems. I don't mean streaming services because that means the Sonos absolutely wins that, that race. I mean streaming systems like AirPlay, Chromecast, Rune, Tidal Connect, Spotify Connect, and also 
the Wim amp gives us physical control buttons, and yeah, just the whole thing feels much more substantial in the hand. I'm talking about the Wim amp. The Sonos amp is all plastic, like the Pro Plus. So basically, I'm amazed that Wim has managed to wrap their amp in aluminium or aluminum in the USA and Canada for under one half of the Sonos amps asking and without farming the power supply out to any kind of external brick, like everything's built into the unit. Now inside the unit, we get power ratings for loudspeakers as follows. 60 watts per channel into eight ohms, 120 watts per channel into four ohms. So those aren't baller numbers, but they're plenty for a pair of Project Box 5S2. And as we shall see, once we had a subwoofer, those numbers, the 60 watts per channel, the 120 watts per channel, become far less crucial. Now, I had to double check with Wim on this next thing, and they confirmed that the ADC that greets the analog input on the back of the amp is basically pulled across from the Pro Plus. And despite originally planning and telling me that they were gonna pull the DAC across as well, the, the DAC circuit inside the amp isn't built around an AKM chip, it's built around an ESS Sabre, I think it's a 9018, which is like a flagship chip that ESS used to make about five or six years ago. Now, like their network streamers, WIMS amp is a complete breeze to onboard onto a Wi-Fi network. So when we power it on, we pull up the home app and it automatically discovers the amp you know, in the rack or on top of our sideboard or wherever it is. And then it asks us for our Wi-Fi network credentials and then it injects those into the amp so that then the amp can connect directly to our Wi-Fi network. And once it's done that, it pulls down any firmware updates. And basically, I was up and running five minutes after unboxing the amp, which is just great. This is what I love about FutureFi. It's super easy to get up and running and there isn't just this kind of nest of cables that you have to negotiate and sort of work out what goes where. Now, a little bit unexpectedly, and I really like this, Wim has added voice messages that play out of the amp and into the speakers that tell us when the amp is connected to a Wi-Fi network or even to an ethernet network, I think. I haven't used ethernet here, but there is a socket on the back panel. I've only ever used Wi-Fi with the Wim amp. Had no issues whatsoever with network stability or Wi-Fi connection glitches, none of those. It was just perfect. And also, if we turn the amp off and on again, we hear a startup sound that lets us know when the system is ready to play music. And that restart, I think a reboot, yeah, takes about 30 seconds. So after doing all the initial updates, I was really keen to hear, yet again, because I'm in love with this album at the moment, the Mountain Goats' Jenny from Thebes. Great record, although, if you're not into sort of American indie rock, you're probably not gonna like it. Now, the Wim Project pairing, I think, lends greater priority to that album's rhythm and swing with the, the string section's tonality taking more of a back seat. And that much I also heard from Ricardo Villalobos' Alcachofa, which is a, it's a minimal techno classic, and I'm playing it again at the moment because it was issued again on vinyl, I think about a month ago, for the first time since its mid-2000s release. Again, if you're not into minimal techno, you're probably not gonna like that too much either. However, furrowed browed audiophiles might actually quite dig John Cale's Fragments of a Rainy Season, which tells us that the whim's transparency is more overt than is the delivery of a piano's timbre. And it's a similar story with the strings that haunt Laurel Halo's otherwise sort of ambient washed Atlas. Again, a very, very interesting record. It's super, it's kind of woozy. It's a bit like uh, a fever dream. It, it takes you by surprise. I thought it was boring when I first heard it, but it really has kind of got its hooks into me now. Now in Wim Project Hands, the strings on that Laurel Halo album, 
they enjoy nicely focused soundstage placement, but come up ever so slightly short on the inflections or the, the tonal qualities that we get from more luxurious amplification. And yes, I am being super nitpicky here, but please know that the whim does not sound gray or washed out or anything like that. It's just not as tonally saturated as say, the thousand euro Marantz Stereo 70S, which I also have here for review right now. And given the price differential between the Wim and the Marantz, we wouldn't expect the Wim to sound as good as the Marantz. Well, I wouldn't anyway. So for me, the Wim draws instrument shapes with crisper edges than the Marantz. But I think the Marantz sounds more natural and also it has an MM phono input, which the Wim doesn't have. But flipping it around, most obvious of all, the Wim puts Marantz's HEOS streaming capabilities in the shade. And doing this side-by-side -side comparison, I basically worked out that the Wim amp seems to belong to the sort of clean, lean, and lit up school of sound reproduction. Now I speak to Terry Ellis at Pursuit Perfect System, you know, once every couple of weeks, and I told him about my findings about the Wim amp, and he suggested that I use the graphic or the parametric EQ inside the Wim Home app to make the amp sound meatier and fleshier. Now you can do that and it might work, but only to a point. You know, EQ alone won't turn the Wim into say an Audio Lab 6000A play, which for me sounds, comparatively speaking, warmer and fuller of body than the Wim. So if I want to get really pretentious here, I would say that if the Wim is a sparkling white, then the Audio Lab is a creamier Chardonnay. And that means that the amp's closest sonic and functional cousin, I think, is the Blue Sound Power Node Edge, which sells in Europe for I think 650 euros. So roughly twice the price of the Wim. So yeah, here comes another side-by-side -side comparison. So the white Canadian box pushes forward the hi-hats on Biosphere's microgravity, I think with marginally less urgency than the Wim. It's a bit more laid back, it's a bit softer, and the Wim is a bit keener, a bit more front of foot. And so if I'm gonna get pretentious again, I would say that if the Blue Sound Edge is a full stop, then the Wim is an exclamation mark. But that's not really a delta or a difference that I would swear on. It's small, you know, it's not night and day. As usual, nothing is getting blown out of the water or destroyed, only the credibility of people who use that kind of language. <laughs> but I think what is more obvious to me as a listener is that the Blue Sound and the Wim are better suited to Bjork's modern pop or say, Daniel Avery's Electronica than the string-driven works of Strauss or Vivaldi. Now, did you know that pretty much all Wim products now offer two-way Bluetooth, just like the Blue OS that runs on a Blue Sound device? Because I didn't, and I only found this out recently when I was playing catch up on the change logs inside the Wim Home app and on their website. And it seems to me that the Wim is enjoying a furious, furious rate of development at the hands of its own in-house software team. And therefore, that's a sharp reminder that Futurify is as much about software as it is about hardware. Similarly, listener satisfaction with Biosphere's microgravity is as much about sub-bass heft and womp as it is about that sort of crisp and clean hi-hat delivery. And a subwoofer becomes essential when running stand mounts like the Project that don't easily dip below 50 hertz without the room's assistance. So after connecting a KEF KC62 to the subwoofer output on the back of the WIM, I pulled up the home app to find that basically WIM's developers have coded 
a brand new base management screen. Now, where this steps ahead of Blue OS is yes, we can set the crossover point just like Blue OS, but unlike Blue OS, we can also set a gain level. We can go plus or minus, and there's a toggle switch for setting the phase. Now, the upshot of that really is, <laughs> I guess it's for me as somebody who likes to dial in a sub with as much ease as possible, is that I can do it all from my listening seat here without ever having to stand up, right? Because I don't have to adjust the gain level on the back of the KEF sub or play with the face toggle switch on the back of the sub. I can do it all with the app from the comfort of the couch. And you can't do that yet anyway, at least. I don't know if it's coming or not, but you can't do that with Blue OS. You have to get out of your chair and adjust the gain and then sit back down again and listen and then go back and adjust the gain again. Yeah, so it's a bit more of a faff and a kerfuffle to set up a sub with a blue sound device than it is with Wim's new amp. But obviously, all of the bass management smarts inside the Wim amp are DSP powered. And that also means that we get high pass filtered loudspeaker outputs, just like we get with the Blue Sound Power Node Edge. And if you want to hear firsthand what high pass filtering can do for a two way stand mount, like the Project Speakerbox 5S2, then all you have to do is physically disconnect the sub and then pull up the Wim Home app and then turn the sub on and off. And when it's on, you should obviously hear less bass wallop, but you might also hear, as I do, greater mid-range clarity. But I think there is a bigger payoff to having a 2.1 system with high-pass filtering. And that, for me, basically means that I have much less of a inclination to swap out the WIM amp for a different model, right? It just, that kind of edge of whatever the other amp will have on its own becomes seriously blunted. You know, that maybe it's a power advantage or a quality advantage, but once we have the low bass farmed out to a subwoofer and its amp, then the main amp is only doing mid-range and treble and so, you know, it's doing two thirds of what it was previously. And therefore that means that any audible differences between the Blue Sound Power Node Edge and the WIM amp become less overt once the subwoofer has been added to the system. But the real kicker here is the WIM amp does everything that the Blue Sound Power Node Edge does, apart from wired headphones, for half of its asking price, which I think is just astonishing, really. However, it isn't all smooth sailing with the WIM amp. You kind of expected there'd be a gotcha, didn't you? Because I said at the start that this amp was superb, but it's not perfect. So for example, if I'm watching TV and I turn off my TV at night to go to bed, when I do that, I can still hear the amp doing some weird put 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 sounds out of the subwoofer. And sometimes those sounds come out of the speakers as well. So that's not great. And in order to get rid of that, I have to switch the amp over to another input. I usually switch it back to the streaming input and then I don't have to worry about, yeah, hearing noises while I'm sleeping from downstairs. That also happens with the Toslink input from time to time as well. It doesn't always happen, but again, in order to get rid of it, I have to switch the input from the Toslink to another input just to stop that sort of very low level, it's not loud, low level sort of put, 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 coming out of the sub and or the loudspeakers. But I must stress that this is nothing that we can hear during playback, right? I can't hear this low level put, 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 even during quiet passages when listening to the projects, the KEF and the WIM as a 2.1 setup. However, when we were filming the B-roll for this video, I did notice that rebooting the amp, sometimes we get that sort of low level noise, the same kind of low level put, put, put noise, comes out of the loudspeakers during startup. I think there's some kind of noise interference going on inside my review sample. Now, somebody asked me after I put this review over on my website, somebody asked me, do you have a pre-production sample? Now, I normally put my foot down and go, no, I don't take those. But sometimes manufacturers don't tell me 
when they're sending me a pre-production sample. I don't think this one is. I think I've got a retail version. So yeah, it's a minor niggle. It's by no means a deal breaker, not at all. But then there was a time, one time, <laughs> when I was listening to music and then all of a sudden, the Wim amp suddenly stopped sending a signal to my sub and I couldn't fix it until I rebooted the amp. Again, not a deal breaker, just a minor niggle and it only did it once and it hasn't done it since that first time. And lastly, be very careful around the WIMS metal chassis in the winter because I went to sort of feel the texture on the WIM logo and I felt this static charge zap into the WIM amp and it was playing at the time and it just went into like a sort of CD skipping kind of mode, like, a g -g 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 like that and I had to just pull the power out. I thought I'd fried it, but thankfully I hadn't. I replugged it in and everything worked as it did before. So that's just something to be aware of. That might be unique to where I live or to my, it might be unique to my rug or to me, I don't know. But again, yeah, a minor niggle, but definitely not a deal breaker. But I think it should be pointed out that we don't get any of these issues from the Blue Sound Power Node Edge. But then again, tell me which more costly streaming amplifier gives us two-way Bluetooth, Google Chromecast, Tidal Connect, Spotify Connect, Apple AirPlay 2, AirPlay Casting, so it can transmit AirPlay signals, and Rune Readiness, plus Alexa and Siri voice control, and subwoofer bass management, and HDMI connectivity, right? Tell me what super expensive streaming amplifier does all of that. I'll wait. Because I don't think there is one. And yet from one Mac mini size device, we get a suite of streaming options that goes beyond even Blue OS's. And we get hardwired connectivity that includes the all important HDMI arc and I think equally important, a subwoofer output with proper base management in the software. And I don't think I've seen value for money like this since the arrival of the Logitech Squeezebox Touch in 2010. And that for me makes the WIM amp not only a Darko award winner, so a knockout award winner, but a very strong contender for product of the year. So if you liked this video, if you thought it was entertaining or informative or a bit of both, then please consider liking and subscribing down below. And if you like my attitude towards hi-fi, then please consider supporting me on Patreon, because on Patreon, that's where you'll find playlists for this video. So basically music heard in this video and seen in this video on phone screens and TVs, and also playlists for all the other videos that I've made in the last two or three years. So if you'll consider supporting me on Patreon, even if it's just for like a month or something, just to buy me a cup of coffee in this cold weather because it's snowing like crazy right now, then that would be absolutely superb. Yeah, thank you ever so much for watching.